first of all, I'd like to say a huge thank you for inviting me. It's, as we were saying together last night, it can be easy enough to get invited to speak to uh, an archaeological association once, but getting invited a second time can be a bit more tricky. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking to you about the persistent place. 5,000 years of archaeology at Gortlonacht, County Cavan in Ireland. And it's always good to start off with a bit of uh, content. So this is what we're going to be doing. There's going to be an introduction down through this. We can sum it up like this. There's going to be an introduction and a preamble. We're going to go through the chronology of the site. And then there's going to be conclusions. And for anybody that's still awake, you're uh, more than welcome to attempt to ask me questions. I would describe this as the linear vertical way through this presentation. It's slide after slide after slide. What I'd also like to introduce is some ideas around recurring themes. So one of the ones, the themes I want to keep coming back to in this is the connections between Gertlonacht and other Irish archaeological sites. And these are themes about interconnectedness and explicability. So we can think about that there are some wonderful things here, but most of them can be understood in terms of other archaeology from the island of Ireland. Basically, the site is interesting, there are some insights, there are some issues, but most things we can understand in terms of the Irish archaeology as a whole. So in that way, we could retitle this Gortlona County Cavan and its place in Irish archaeology. Another recurring theme is about how archaeologists construct narratives. And I'm afraid to say it, but quite frequently, archaeologists giving this kind of chronological run-through of an individual site, it can be a little bit stale, it can be a little bit boring. And in some respects, what I've talked to you so far about are themes around, well, essentially, it's the sheep's clothing. But this is the wolf, because this is a, about how we deliberately select and present specific information to create our, our story. And stories are essential to the human experience. It doesn't matter whether you're five years old or 50 or even 500, you love stories. It's what we love as humans. We read novels, we tell stories around campfires, we watch movies, and it's about this, if you want to be kind of you know, academic -y sounding about it, you call it creating a narrative. And it, I hope it doesn't come as too much of a surprise to find out that archaeologists are humans as well. And we love to create stories. So what I want to do here is look at some of the difficulties of this site and how we understand and how we get some ideas about the, the stories we tell, essentially. So with that, we might instead retitle this lecture, How to Lie with Data and Get Invited to Speak to Learned <laughs> Societies. <laughs> okay, nobody's rushing the stage, so we're, we're, we're good. So with that, I'm going to look at some ideas around the where and the why of this site. So the, the literal where is where this dock is up here on the, air, the map of Ireland. It's in Western County Cabin, and it's on, we can see the area that we're looking at here. This is uh, the, the, the outline of the site that we were working on. It's the physical where is this part of cabin, and the, the why we were here was that there was a large company that wanted to get to the underlying limestone bedrock and extract it for, uh, for making cement. So this is the area of the proposed quarry, this road leading into it here. I was involved in the archaeological monitoring of this from April 2006 to January 2008. The guy that owned the, the quarry drove this new road across the mountain. We found no archaeology on any of it. We started on this area of the quarry. We found no archaeology on any of it. And then we got here. This is the site we're going to be talking about today. And one of the whys here that we were, uh, why is the archaeology here and not, not anywhere else, is that this particular area represents a flat shelf of land. And we have 
the landscape basically slopes up to this is a foothill associated with Sleeve Russian. Landscape slopes up, there's not really all that much flat land. It slopes down into the Blackwater Valley. Again, not much, uh, not flat land. This little part here begins a shelf of land along this side of the mountain. And it comes to a very prosaic thing. You want some flat land that's well drained, excuse me, that you can build on, and that you can put down a pot, a pig, or a child, and they won't roll away. That's essentially what it comes down to. So that's kind of the, the part of the why that there's archaeology here and not elsewhere. What do we find? Well, we carried out excavations from May until August 2008. And as you'll see, here we found this large subcircular enclosure. You can see it also on the uh, aerial photography there. So we found that. We found a uh, rather strange uh, subrectangular one there beside it. And not on the post-excavation plan, but on the aerial photograph, you can see this enclosure here. We actually found that that's an upstanding rath or ringfort. It's a, a defended settlement of the early medieval period. So we, we had a, an opportunity to, uh, to, to, to put some test trenches into that as well. So what range of periods? Well, we're talking about from the Middle Neolithic up to the medieval period. And if you want to kind of break that out a bit, you can look at the chronology like this. So we have it phased out from phases one to, to six. Basically, we got something for every one of these. That is what gives us our 5,000 years of continuous settlement. What makes it really interesting is that, in the grand scheme of things, this is a fairly small and compact site. It's about 500 metres by 500 metres. And one thing we need to address is the, this name, Gortlánacht. Well, it comes from Irish. The second part, the Lánacht, comes from Lemonacht, or Lemloch in, in Old Irish, which means new milk. And then the first part is Gort, or Gort, which means a field. So together, it is the field of the new milk. This is particularly tantalizing when you consider that a lot of the townland names, the specific uh, location names in Ireland, are thought to come from the early medieval period. And the early medieval period is known for having a dairying economy. And here we have a name that directly references that dairying economy. And we've got a big portion of what we're looking at is also an early medieval site. So there is something very tantalizing there. And as Julie Andrews said, let's start at the very beginning. We're going to go right back to the Middle Neolithic. I'm going to keep returning to this particular slide, just to give you an idea of where we are, orient ourselves across the whole site. So the first thing I want, to, want us to look at, it seems very, very prosaic and simple. It's a natural sinkhole. We identified it. We began excavating it. I gave the excavation over of that to a particular colleague of mine. We worked out it was a, a natural sinkhole. And I said, let's stop. And he said, no. And he convinced me time and time again that we shouldn't let this go. He just felt there was something there. And practically on the last day of the excavation, after finding not an awful lot to be excited about, he found these, which also don't particularly look like a lot to be excited about. They are, in fact, two rim shirts and about over 20 body shirts that represented a portion of a substantial decorated middle Neolithic globular bowl. And this is one of the rim shirts quite nicely decorated. <laughs> Lovely thing in itself, but not unique within Irish archaeology. It can be paralleled at sites in Tyrone, Londonderry, Antrim, Louth, Dublin, quite a well-known type. But the question I want to ask is, why is this bowl here? Why is this bowl in this natural sinkhole? There are a number of other archaeological sites that have deliberate deposition within sinkholes. And part of the thinking, certainly part of my thinking around that, is that in a pre-scientific society, if a hole miraculously, apparently, opens up in the ground in front of you, you may think it has a supernatural significance. It may be appropriate to respond in a ritualistic manner by deposition. And I say that it's not in this case, because associated with the layers that this particular bowl came out of, 
we also found iron slag that is much, much later than the Middle Neolithic. So instead, I'm thinking that this is probably accidental, that we had the bowl maybe uh, deposited in another feature, the sinkhole opened up, and the bowl simply fell in. Perhaps there was, it opened up and somebody went, oh, we just need to get anything you can. Shovel it in, fill it up. And th that's how... So you can either go for the, this is ritual, this is serious, or this is just very convenient, get it out of the way. <coughs> I want to think about the Middle Neolithic. Conventionally dated, it's about 3500 to 20, 2900 BC, about 600 years. And I'm only going to do this once, but this kind of serves as an object lesson for an awful lot of what we're going to be talking about today. So it's got 600 years, and we've got that one Middle Neolithic bowl from it. There is another Middle Neolithic bowl from a place called Kilshane in County Dublin. It is associated with a radiocarbon date, and it's dated to that period from 3645 to 3390 Cal BC. So it's pushed it out there right to the very, very beginning of the Middle Neolithic, actually overlapping into the end of the late Neolithic. And the question is, what's happening for those other 500 years? There are two points I want to make here. The first of all is, there's the fragility of the evidence. This entire chapter of the physical human activity on this site comes down to one accidental survivor from that time. And the other thing is, you really need to be wary of archaeologists who talk about continuity. Because it may not be quite as continuous as they're making out. So with that, we're going to move on to the late Neolithic. So it's this area up here in the circle. And it's just outside the, the entrance to the early medieval uh, enclosure. And we have this little kind of groups of pits and features Quite ordinary in their own way, they, they look. This one, for example, this is uh, uh, feature 401. The bottom fill here had three chert flakes, and the charcoal there pr produced a late Neolithic radiocarbon date. So, nice late Neolithic date. We're onto a good thing here. This particular feature here, the upper fill produced chert and flint flakes, some spalls, some cores, so a good stoneworking uh, tradition. The bottom fill produced a late Neolithic grooved ware bowl. And we can get a little bit of a closer look at it here as it was being excavated and in its site drawing. If anybody ever asks you the question, how do you excavate a late Neolithic grooved ware pot? The answer is very, very carefully. <laughs> that came up out of the ground in one piece. And when we uh, excavated out its contents and had it conserved, this is what it looked like uh, as it was drawn up. And what we're looking at is the intact basal portion and a number of other shards from this grooved ware vessel. Archaeologists aren't always great at giving names. And this is called a grooved ware vessel because it is decorated with grooves. <laughs> it's, it's really, it is genuinely that simple. There's one on the inside of the, the, the rim and then there's two more obvious ones on the, the bottom of the base. And there, that, that's, it, it's a lovely find, but it's not unique. It can be paralleled on a number of sites in Meath, in Down, in County Tipperary. So there, there's something uh, nice but explicable here. So to move on to the Bronze Age, and the first thing you're going to notice, I hope, is that we haven't moved we're still in the same area. And this is because there's something else going on with this collection of features. Everything in a circle there had parts of indeterminate Bronze Age vessels in them. So they're, they're kind of ordinary uh, Bronze Age vessels. The one in the square had a fragment of a Bronze Age cinnary urn. And these are all features, again, that are still associated with late Neolithic uh, archaeology. So take, for example, this one. I did mention that the bottom fill had three chert flakes and that late Neolithic radiocarbon date. And further up in the fill, there's, there's Bronze Age material. So the question is, what's going on? And I said we love stories, but we actually we love simple stories with easy resolutions. 
And we have to admit that there's something more complex going on here. And part of understanding that complexity is looking at this feature, that the upper fill here produced a number of chert flakes and this rather nice quartzite hammerstone. And if you look rather carefully, on both ends, there's pecking damage that shows it was used. It's not just a, a regular pebble. This was actually used to reduce a lump of flint down into its constituent parts to make blades and uh, eventually a core. So we have that. Now, in questions in what's happening here, one of the first things I try to think about was, could you somehow Shanghai this set of features into looking like a, uh, like, like a structure? So I drew a number of lines, and you can sort of make the, the outside one look like it's part of a curve. You, it doesn't work with the inside one. That, that's just a mess. And it is, it's tempting, but the, of course the other thing is that there's, there's no evidence of post holes here. Uh, specifically, we'd be looking for post pipes. Those are the evidence of decayed posts within these fills. It's not there. Of course, the other thing that is an issue here is the problem of depth. And it varies. It's, uh, some of these deepest ones are about three quarters of a meter deep. Others are down to about just over 10 centimeters. So there's, there's, a, there's something going on here. Part of our understanding around this is the grooved wear. Admittedly, sometimes it is found on domestic sites. However, it's most usually found on ritual sites. And that, that I think, is part of my thinking is how we, we move this to, is this a, a ritual, is this a, uh, something special going on here? The other thing I want to point out is that we took a lot of samples from these. These were all sieved and they were examined, uh, all the contents examined. And we found the occasional extra flint blade and such. But what we didn't find was any micro debitage. These are the tiny little portions of flint that break off and fly around the place when you're reducing down from a pre-prepared flint down to a final uh, set of tools. What that would imply to us is that, well, if it's not there, it's not there for a reason. You can't hide this. So this, this area isn't being used uh, to prepare these blades and flakes. Instead, what's, what, what's happening or what we think is happening is that these are being prepared elsewhere and they're being deliberately deposited here. And with these pieces of evidence coming together, the alternate theory we can look at is that these, these pits as a group possibly span quite a bit of time, but they were created solely for that act of deposition. And the term that's used here is structured deposition. And it's, a lot of archeologists are wary of using the term ritual. We, we tend to overuse it, but I think it, it works here because, and what we may be looking at is a group of features that functioned as a ritual area devoted to that deliberate deposition of, uh, of those things that survived, the, the ceramics and the lithics. When people talk about uh, structured deposition, it's generally in terms of a way of giving back to the land. It sounds maybe kind of a bit tree-hugging and hippie-ish, but this is certainly some things that are paralleled in uh, ethnography, where you see the, the earth being thanked for its bounty, and perhaps we're getting something similar here. The other thing that gives us an opportunity to think about are what other items were put into the ground that don't survive. So we've got, obviously, the stuff that survives. We've got the flint, we've got the chert, we've got the pottery. But what... Could there have been foodstuffs put in there, um, such as, well, for example, we found a number of charred hazelnuts uh, and hazelnut shells from one of those features. Though there could have been other things that don't survive, like items of leather, wood, fabric. Or the last one I want to think about is liquids, because we took up that grooveware pot, very, very carefully transported it back to our laboratories. We removed its contents, and those I personally sieved, and with the hope of finding something really cool inside it. And all that was inside it was exactly the same earth that was outside it. There's a possibility that it went into the ground as an empty vessel, but there's also the possibility that it originally went into the ground with a liquid in it, something maybe like mead or beer or something interesting. And it gives us those opportunities to think about what else is going on, the things that don't survive. 
And then we still have the question, but what about the Bronze Age? And we can either see that as later intrusive depositions within a you know, longer uh, cultural, um, sorry, we can either see them as intrusive depositions onto late Neolithic material, or we can see them as part of a longer cultural continuity. The reality, of course, is that there are no archaeological periods in the past. On the 1st of January, 2200 BC, nobody said, put down your flint tools, because we're now a Bronze Age culture. So again, be wary of archaeologists that talk exclusively in, the, in these ideas of periods. So he's sticking immediately to the Bronze Age. Um, here at the centre of our early medieval enclosure, we have a ring ditch. And it's subcircular. It's about six and a half by six metres. In fact, it's very subcircular. There is a former colleague of mine who had this theory of ring ditches. He said they're always circular, except when they're not. And they always have a central burial, except when they don't. And this is a, a not, don't one. And part of the reason that this isn't perfectly circular is the construction technique. Because what they did was they removed the subsoil, but left all the bedrock untouched. Now, indeed, the reason that we were there is because the, there's a lot of this limestone bedrock. It's very near the surface, as you can see from the, the slide. And they just didn't even attempt to remove it. We have two radiocarbon dates from the, on charcoal from the fill that indicate a late Bronze Age date. So in terms of finds, all the finds were found just where that dot is. And to make this worse, to get it, give us an idea of how wide and how deep this ditch was, I got one of my colleagues to excavate, and I said, you know, pick your favourite spot. He picked, essentially, that little area there. And he found all the finds. Another colleague of mine, equally skilled archaeologist, ended up excavating the entirety of that ring ditch himself and didn't find a single extra thing. Everything was in that one pot, uh, spot. And what was there? There was a portion of an irregular chert flake. There were a number of shards of an undecorated Bronze Age vase, vase urn that dates to the early Bronze Age. And there's just a little over half a kilo of burnt bone. And in terms of the burial, the burnt bone tells us, uh, we, when, when it was examined, the analysis showed that it included portions of uh, skull, fragments of a couple of teeth. Altogether, we reckon that it shows one male aged between 24 to 45 years at the time of death. A portion that we think uh, came from a humerus shows a, a, a pathological lesion. So this guy got a very ornate burial for its time, a personalised, specialised burial, but he also had a hard life. And basically dying at the age of 45 at maximum isn't a particularly long life either. Interestingly, the person that did the analysis on this was able to estimate the pyre temperatures from the bones. And they estimated it to be somewhere between 645 to up to 1200 degrees centigrade. So this was quite a, a, a big, fearsome fire that the, the guy was cremated in. We also, certainly when we think of the past and how we look at cremations, we have a tendency to imagine that the body was placed with whatever amount of ritual onto a cremation pyre it was lit. When everything died down, the, the bones were taken up and then they were buried. What we're actually finding here, what we find in a lot of these the, these type of burials, is that there was an extra stage in processing that the bones were essentially ground up. And this is why after half a kilo of bone, there's actually very little of it that is easily identified. So this, this type of uh, processing or grinding is called comminution. So there's a lot of grinding. This is like, by the time it got to us, it looked like white dust. So did you notice the problem that I didn't mention? there's a little bit of a dating problem. Because on one side, we've got that vase urn. It dates to the early Bronze Age. It's of an undecorated type, and it can be paralleled on various sites, including examples from Londonderry and from Tyrone. And then on the other side, 
we've got those two radiocarbon dates that date to the late Bronze Age. At best, there's like 550 years difference between those. So the question is, how do we reconcile it? And how do you deal with this apparently inconsistent data? And I said, well, is there really a dating problem here? Because there doesn't have to be a discrepancy between the two ideas. We have to remember that this ring ditch didn't exist in a single moment. It probably existed on the landscape for a very long period of time before finally becoming invisible. And with that in mind, I am taking this, these apparently diverging pieces of information and constructing a narrative. And my narrative suggests that the original form of the, the, the ring ditch was created in the Bronze Age, the, ma the vessel was manufactured in that, the early Bronze Age. You've got to remember that what we see now as just that circular ditch, the material from that would have been mounted up probably with an internal bank and or an internal uh, little mound. As there's no, there's no evidence of a, a, a hole in the centre for the burial to be put into, it's most likely that the burial was incorporated directly into that little mound. And so that all happens in the early Bronze Age. Then, half a millennium later, and then in the late uh, Bronze Age, we've got uh, the artefacts, the burial, removed from their original places within the mound and then dumped in the ditch. And certainly the way I see the, the evidence coming together is that the... The charcoal from the ditch relates to later uh, activity, not the construction. And why would anybody do this? That's the question. It seems it's a nice way to, to try and sort out an answer, but it doesn't answer why that might have happened. And admittedly, it is speculative, but in other areas in Ireland where we've looked at that transition from the early to the, to the late Bronze Age, we found that there's occasionally evidence for changes or shifts within burial ritual and would possibly reflecting changes and shifts in social polity and the transformation of wider cultural and power relationships. The question is, why do these things happen? Why is there a break in society in essentially around the Middle, uh, the middle Bronze Age? And it seems a little bit almost too trendy to have to, to say this, but it does appear to be related to climate change. Because in the Middle Bronze Age, the climate in Ireland becomes much, much wetter. Soils become less fertile, and we may be seeing evidence of the contraction of society through, uh, through death, through famine. And part of that may be related to changing of, from old types of uh, burial to new types, possibly related to new ideas about religion and gods. It's very, very complex. It's a much, much bigger topic than I can attempt to cover here today. But it's something to think about, that why you're getting, why, why do things start, tend to go bad in that break between the early and the late Bronze Age? The one thing I would say is that, in my theory, although we have that remodeling or the slighting of the ring ditch in the late Bronze Age, it wouldn't necessarily totally remove it from, from, from sight. It could possibly still be visible, certainly by the time of the early medieval period. The reason I'm highlighting this now is that I want to pick up this theory, dust it off, and repurpose it further on in this presentation. So you kind of set in the, the sights for this. Uh, sticking with the Bronze Age, down here we have a lovely Bronze Age scenery urn. And this is it. The slightly circular part you can see at the centre is the base and essentially what has happened is that it was put vertically into the ground and it has opened out like a flower. There's 16 rim sherds, there's uh, the base is uh, made up of about 10 sherds and there's over 330 body sherds involved here. So it's a wonderful piece of excavation by uh, my colleagues at the time. And this is what it looks like when we finally got it out of the ground, conserved, and stuck partially back together. Lovely piece. 
but again, can be explained. We know of other types uh, from, uh, from funerary contexts in County Down and County Antrim. This one, when it was examined by our pottery specialist, uh, she noted that there, on the interior there, uh, there were uh, ev evidence of uh, residues, and on the exterior there were spillage marks. So something was spilled or poured out of this while it was still hot, and the, the marks stayed there. So the question is, was, was this related to, in some respect, to, you know, to food preparation? And that leaves us with the cinnary urn problem, because the other examples that we've discussed have all been related to, to funerary activities, burial activity. But this one seems to have evidence of food use. And this is unusual. This is very, very unusual. But it may indicate that the consumption or the preparation of food uh, as a ritual activity. Now, this is, this is only one, so it, it may be an anomalous one. Of course, then there's the other cinnary urn problem, because I didn't tell you that it's actually found in a sinkhole. Now, the Neolithic globular bowl was found in a sinkhole, and I interpreted that as an accidental deposition. And here it's harder to know, because on one side you could say, we have this pre-scientific society, a hole opened up in the ground, and it required as an appropriate ritual response. And maybe that's why our scenery in here has no human bone associated with it, has perhaps used in food preparation, and perhaps placed ritually into the ground. So we can, we can kind of punt that as a theory. The other side of it is, maybe it really is just a, an old uh, cooking vessel that they wanted to get rid of into a convenient hole in the ground. So these are the two opposite ends of where we can think about this. This is the location uh, just outside our enclosure of a Bronze Age vase urn. So on the left, this is what it was like. It was found at the bottom of a feature fa face down. So we're looking at, uh, and then the photo on the right is literally in the moments after we, we took it up. So we have three rim sherds and one body sherd beautifully decorated. This is it as it got cleaned up, photographed and drawn. The vessel can be paralleled uh, with a no number of others of similar type and to actually quite a narrow band of time, to about 100 years to 1900 to about 1800 BC. It's contemporary with the vessel uh, in the ring ditch. But here's the question. This is down at the bottom of an undisturbed feature there are only four sherds, and there's no burial. This is burial-related pottery, but there's no burial, and there's only part of it. I don't have an answer here, but it's the type of thing that archaeologists tend to shy away from trying to answer. I'm just going to try and shy away from saying that I don't have an answer. Almost everything we've looked at so far, certainly with the Bronze Age, has been burial-related. I want to pick out two features here uh, that are, one is a, a burnt mound and the other is a, a possible burnt mound. This is one type of feature that actually needs a little bit of a, an introduction and explanation. Burnt mounds are sometimes known as fulopafia in Irish and what you start with is a large trough full of water. You heat stones in a fire, you apply the stone to the fire, or sorry, the, 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 the stone from the fire into the water. The, the, the water is heated, the stone quite frequently shatters. The unreusable bits are thrown up uh, outside and can frequently form a large mound of burnt material. So that's why they're called burnt mounds. I told you, archaeologists aren't always great at naming stuff. <laughs> they, they can date from the Mesolithic period, some of the earliest archaeology in Ireland, up to the early medieval period, but they absolutely concentrate, like 90% or probably more, are all from the early Bronze Age. And, well, what were they for? Usually, when we're looking at this and what the literature says, is they were used for cooking. And certainly there's a lot of work has been done with uh, experimental work where somebody's taken a nice tasty joint of venison, they've wrapped it up uh, in, we say, straw rope or straw matting to protect it, put it into the water, 
went through the process, heated the stones, dropped them into the water. And while we may think that the process of cooking has changed, the physics of cooking hasn't, because it's still 20 minutes a pound and 20 minutes over. So that hasn't changed. However, there's not an awful lot of evidence that they were used for cooking. So basically anything you can use large amounts of warm water for has been suggested. So people have suggested that they were used for saunas or for sweat houses for, for bathing. Uh, inevitably that has been suggested to be ritual bathing. Um, people have suggested that they were for dyeing textiles or perhaps curing hides. There's a rather interesting idea that they were deliberately used to co collect fat from meat to be used in uh, essentially uh, food, food preservation. However, the most interesting one for any archaeologist, and this is what's happening in this photograph, is uh, some old friends of mine got the idea that they could be used for brewing. And these are the guys from uh, uh, the Moore Group, and they proved that you can take and heat the water and you can turn this into beer, and they've made some very, very tasty beer. <laughs> it's not conclusive, but I like the beer idea. And what we've got here is, uh, this is trough one, all the fills here that we discovered, they were all charcoal-rich deposits of fire-cracked and heat-affected stones. The lowest fill here, we got a radiocarbon date uh, that put it into the late Neolithic, early Bronze Age crossover, which puts it exactly overlapping that late Neolithic, early Bronze Age area, uh, ritual area that we're talking about. So the date and the form both suggest that this was a burnt mound, even though that larger burnt mound itself doesn't survive. Over here beside and you'll recognise the photograph of uh, our sinkhole and partially destroyed by the sinkhole is this other trough. Unfortunately, even on the best funded uh, excavations you can't get to date everything. This one we couldn't date, but given its form, we reckon, again with all this charcoal and uh, fire cracked stone, it too probably was a, a, a burnt mound trough. And then we come to the Iron Age, and we have this possible Iron Age structure here. And yeah, we can see it pretty clearly here. I've turned it on its side so it kind of, it's larger on this slide. It's a single annular, meaning unbroken, wall slot. The, the, the wall slot is up to a metre wide, about half a metre deep, and it formed this kind of trapezoidal or uh, sub-rectangular shape. North-south, the, the longest side, it's about 16 metres. It goes from about three and a half metres internally, sorry, um, yeah, six metres internally, narrowing down to about three and a half metres. In total, it's about 50 square metres that this encloses. Just as a parallel for this, I was trying to find, you know, what, what sort of buildings that we would be familiar with that are around that size. I was horrified to discover that some of the smallest apartments you can rent in New York are significantly smaller than this. It's not huge. Uh, what you can also see in, along here on the east wall is this large uh, contemporary set of, uh, it's a one large post pit, and it's over a metre deep, and it's got five ancillary post holes. And that's where the problems with this feature just start. The first problem is the dating problem we got two radiocarbon dates. Now, any archaeologist who gets two radiocarbon dates for one particular feature or structure, especially for a commercial excavation like this, should be very happy. Unfortunately, they were the wrong dates. Because the first one came back, and this is a, a date on charcoal from the slot trench, it came back as Middle Bronze Age. However, charcoal from a sealed corner post hole came back as Iron Age. And in judging between how reliable and more secure the context is, I have to say that the Iron Age one is, uh, is, the, is the better date. So deliberately ignoring the Middle Bronze Age date. Now, you shouldn't just have to, to use one type of evidence. Unfortunately, the artefacts don't help us here either, because... The finds that we've got, the, the, the little one in the corner here, is a rather nice, it's a flint dual platform core. It's not specifically Bronze Age or Iron Age, it's kind of prehistoric, generally. So we can't really narrow it down all that, that well. There's also problems with the morphology, because 
This is unlike any other Bronze Age structure out there. They're usually circular. The problem is that the Iron Age structures that we are familiar with are also usually circular. So this doesn't help. In attempting to understand something about it, I started playing around with it on uh, AutoCAD. The reason I have the ratio of 1 is to 3 up here in the corner is to remind me that there's a kind of rule, in th a rule of thumb with archaeologists that if you have a feature that held a post, th that uh, for every one unit that it goes into the ground, it can support three units uh, above. By which I mean, if you've got a one meter deep post hole, there can be, the, the entire post should be four meters, and three of those meters should be extending uh, above the ground. It's only a, a rule of thumb, but it gives us some ideas. Going by that, our big post here in red should be over four and a half meters tall, and three and, um, uh, sorry, yeah, three and a half meters of that would be out of the ground. There's nothing anywhere else to suggest how this would have worked. So if this was a roof structure, it would have been quite lopsided. When it comes to this rather nice, jaunty fence that I've, I've put in here as a wall slot and my closely argued but entirely speculative place for where the door might have been, that's great, but I have no evidence for anything in the wall slot, with the exception of a couple of corner post holes there and there. So if this was, well, however this was, it would have been an unusual looking structure. Now, we're back to the dreaded ritual. I have, in retrospect, I, I, I think of it as a, something of a cardinal sin. I have published a paper on this where I have argued that this was a ritual enclosure, delimited by this post fence, and whatever type of veneration that was going on was directed at whatever that uh, large uh, pole was. I have speculated on rather shaky evidence, I'm going to be honest, that it might have been in the form of a Native American totem pole, imagine being intricately carved, coloured, and it's a bit of a fight, flight of fantasy. And the question here, rather than trying to put to bed how we see this, is to raise the question about how do we deal with difficult data? Do we ignore it? Do we marginalise it? Or do we let our imaginations run wild? Run wild? What I'm trying to do today is to say, well, these are your various options and this is how we think about these things, rather than being able to give a definitive uh, conclusion. Moving on from there, we go to the early medieval period. And this is the big thing on site. This is a large subcircular enclosure. It's about 65 meters by 50 meters. And as I mentioned earlier, the original uh, entrance was up here to the northwest. And on three sides, it was defined by a shallow ditch that cut the subsoil. And even though much, much later than the, the ring ditch at the center, it left, it was done in the same way, it left the bedrock untouched. And as you see here, we've excavated away all the soil, but all the bedrock is still there. On the, the fourth side, on the east side, the ditch was destroyed by later uh, features, and it was incorporated into the drainage system around. However, underneath the bank, there was uh, some evidence of the original uh, a bank that enclosed this area. And when we, we examined the finds from the ditch, we got about 20 odd pieces of deer antler. So that would suggest that one of the things that's going on here is either the, the hunting of deer or the collection of shed deer antlers. Unfortunately, we got no part that showed that uh, junction between the antler and the, the deer skull. And if, if they were attached, they were obviously, they were hunted. Uh, versus if they were uh, uh, smooth, they would have uh, perhaps been collected. We got about 50 fragments of animal bone of different types, including uh, parts of a sheep shoulder blade. Some of these had butchery marks on them. So these feed into some of our ideas around stock raising and butchery on the site and how it was used for the uh, processing of uh, animals. 
And we also found fragments of one heavily degraded cow tooth. Now we put that one little piece of evidence, and there isn't much more evidence for, uh, for cows on this site. So we put that against our knowledge of early Christian Ireland, early medieval Ireland, as a cow-based and dairying-based economy. And again, that, those tantalising ideas of this being the field of the new milk. And we come up to the stark reality that there's not an awful lot of archaeological evidence to back that up. The other thing that we got from here was quite a bit of metallic slag, including a possible portion of a furnace bottom. This is kind of the slaggy bit that's left over after all the good iron has been drawn off. So we know that there's iron working going on on this site. In terms of the, the dating of the ditch, we've got a number of radiocarbon dates that conclusively prove there was nice early, uh, early medieval date and that this site was occupied from the 6th to the 8th centuries. And then we come to this internal feature here. This, it's possibly it's a linear gully that was perhaps originally a fence line. And we got a, a radiocarbon date from that as well. And it implies that the settlement there continued on into the 9th century. So it was quite a long piece of early medieval settlement. Excuse me, here. Looking at some of the features internal to that ditch, and we're just going to look at the, this little collection here. We have a possible uh, house or hut site. These, the, the little subrectangular one there might have been about three metres by two and a half metres. These are kind of shed-like. They're very small. Unfortunately, we weren't able to uh, radiocarbon date any of these, but their morphology and their location would suggest that they too are early medieval. So just a little to the north of this one, we have some other ones that, again, that rectangular one is about three meters by two meters. Again, these are kind of shed-like uh, proportions. We have those uh, curving lines. They could be interpreted as fence lines, huts, or uh, parts of huts, or windbreaks. If there is something got to do with uh, huts or um, houses of one kind or another, we have to be aware that we have evidence that this was probably inhabited over several centuries, so we may have evidence that these are constructed at different times. Again, unfortunately, didn't have the, the money to get them all dated. So now, I want to talk to you about a very important part of the site, iron working. One of the things to note, note about early medieval Ireland is that a, it was a dairying economy, but also a lot of time was spent on ironwork. So here we have an ironworking area. We'll zoom in on it closely. So we have this pit that's uh, contained iron slag. We have a rather interesting uh, hearth here uh, with evidence of scorching of the, the underlying soil. Uh, some stake holes uh, put down through it. Again, it produced a lot of iron slag. We have this linear feature that may have been a fence or a wattle wall. Again, lots of iron slag. Iron slag again out of that uh, same sinkhole that we got the globular bowl from. So, great, it's an, it's an iron working area, isn't it? Or is it? Because to tell you that story, to create that narrative, has to drop out a couple of other pieces of information. For example, this feature produced 20 pieces of burnt animal bone and a number of charred seeds. And well, I've just shown you that hearth. It had a number of other pieces uh, in it. These were of uh, cremated human bone. So there's other stuff going on here that isn't as simple and isn't as straightforward as the story that you, we, we, that's easy to tell. I want to take a look at this one. This is a, a little pit up here on its own that produced a quern stone. This is a rotary quern. It's, a, uh, it's actually a broken rotary quern that was used for grinding of, uh, of grain to produce flour. And you can just about see it sticking out of the section there. I've included this post-excavation shot just again to show you that the sides of the pit slope down naturally, beautifully made, until they hit the, the, the bedrock. This is a culture that was more than capable of removing limestone bedrock like this. It's seen quite frequently on other sites but here it just wasn't done. Our cornstone, beautiful thing that it is, it was used for, as I said, for grinding uh, cereals. This one, we believe, broke soon after it was manufactured and was reused 
based on a number of uh, striations that we see on it, possibly for uh, sharpening uh, some of the iron tools. So, again, this kind of points to the fragility of evidence on these sites, because the entire history of the serial production on this site essentially hangs on this one artefact. And because it broke and because it was reused, it also adds something to our understanding of ironworking and uh, repair of uh, and sharpening of, of tools. So there's a lot going on that hangs on one artefact. And if there was a part of this site that I was actually deliberately thinking of not presenting today, it was this. This feature here appears to be an internal ditch, or at least a portion of one. Let's get in a little bit closer, we see it in plan and uh, photograph. Unfortunately, we couldn't date it, it's, but it does curve parallel to the outer ditch, and that to me suggests that the two are contemporary. It's much deeper, it's over a metre deep, but it too leaves the bedrock intact and unexcavated. And the question is, well, was it unfinished? And the answer is, I don't know. What makes this worse, or sorry, you know, just to, to point out about the, the finds, there were 64 pieces of animal bone here. Only seven of them could be identified as being cow bone. So again, that, that wonderful tantalizing field of the new milk and all those implications about uh, cattle and dairying come down to archeologically very small amount of evidence. And this is, one, this is part of uh, cow teeth in this instance. What makes that weird little piece of possible internal ditch even weirder and more annoying is that diagonally opposite, on the other side of the enclosure, there's another piece of an apparently unfinished <laughs> internal ditch. And again, it curves parallel to the outside one. It seems to have been started, but not, st uh, but not completed. And this particular one is actually much more difficult to deal with because it was later incorporated into the field ditches on the site. But it does seem to be contemporary, and I just don't have an answer. And in thinking about all this, I just want to switch very briefly to the idea of the division of space. Because every single dated or suspected early medieval piece of activity all falls basically to the southwest of this line. In fact, this line runs directly down that gully that may have been a fence, fence line that, that's dated to the 9th century. So it's practically halfway across the site. The other side is, there's other stuff going on up there, but none of it is early medieval. We've got some prehistoric stuff up there, but none of it is early medieval. So the question arises, why is half of this enclosure vacant? And the easy answer is, well, I'm sure there's a reason. And the, the, this is where you start kind of questioning your evidence. What do you see? And perhaps, can we argue that one half was used in one way and the other half was used in another way? So down here we've got our evidence for our iron working, our whatever's going on here with uh, those set of huts. We've got our grain uh, pr uh, being processed up there. We've got stuff being sharpened. And then nothing on the other side of that line. So what's going on up there? Is it maybe being used as a small enclosed garden? And we know from early, early historic sources that, uh, that they, they had little small herb gardens and vegetable gardens that you don't want animals breaking into. Perhaps it's a means of corralling animals in so they don't get out and dividing that space so that one doesn't meet the other. It could also be just fortuitous that simply the evidence doesn't survive up here. It's been truncated away. And again, I'm laying it out very honestly, saying these are the ways that this is the evidence you have and these are the ways that we can think about it. And for all I've attempted to say that the archaeology here is explicable in terms of the rest of uh, Ireland, we have to ha be honest and say that this enclosure is fairly unusual. 
Our usual ring for to rat for comparison, this one up here that we, we found versus our excavated one here, that usual rat is about maybe 30 meters in diameter. This one was over 60. Usual rat ditches can be up to three meters wide and two meters deep. This one is a meter wide maximum and 60, 60 centimeters tops. Also, frequently they are rock cut and this one definitely is not. And again, so we can go on with these. There's also the question about what's happening with those internal ditch portions. They're, to my knowledge, pretty much unique in Irish archaeology. So we ask the question, what's happening? Was it left unfinished? Was the bedrock left for later and they just didn't come back to it? And again, I still don't have any answers to the unfinished inner ditch portions. And we know that the small bank and ditch would have been ineffective against, as, as a form of defence. Because a lot of times we think about early medieval uh, habitation as how defensive it was. And th this is not going to make a big bank. Even with a fence on top of that, that's not going to be an easily de defensible uh, position. But we have to be honest and say that this is the evidence we have. We certainly have evidence for early medieval habitation and activity over se several centuries, from that period from the 6th to the 9th centuries. So something is going on. In my theory, the enclosing bank, and it does seem like a bit of a cop-out, but it was small, but it was obviously sufficiently large to do the job that was needed. If that was just to demarcate space or to cordon off effectively one, one piece of space from another. So it may indeed have been ineffective as defence uh, against attack, but it would have been probably sufficient to keep goats out of your, uh, your garden, possibly to keep uh, small children away from your iron working or anything like that. Now, back to the ring ditch. I promised I was coming back. And the question I have is, how visible was it during the early medieval period? If it was still visible, and possibly with a degree of cultural relevance, the choice of this site may have been extremely significant. And it may have been used to reaffirm that cultural connection to the landscape and to kind of ideas about tribal power relations. On the other hand, if it's not visible, the choice of site may be just fortuitous. And we come back to the fact that it's just a natural shelf of land. So which is it? Well, first of all, are there any clues in the evidence? And this is only a suggestion, but all the early medieval activities in the enclosure are all in the area that the ring ditch is in. But not one of them impacts on it in any way. So it is possible that it was visible and it was respected enough not to be disturbed. And I hope you're thinking, that's okay, but, but why? You know, it's great to come up with these theories, but do you have any ideas? Um, and it's actually fairly common when you're excavating <laughs> early medieval sites to find activity predating the early medieval period. And it's, like I said, it's very well attested. However, the evidence for that deliberate selection of an older monument, it's more equivocal. And there are a number of places where we do think it's happening such as a place called Carrickeel County Mayo, uh, Carrigaline Middle County Cork, and there's uh, the, the hill fort, uh, Muhan uh, Hill Fort in County Clare. And certainly in relation to Muhan, the, the argument has been made that the early medieval construction there was intended deliberately to strengthen one group's claim to the earlier monuments and to the power, the social power, that they represented. So if you think about it as saying, we have rights to this because we have the lineage, we have the ancestry here. And whether that's real, whether that's fake, those are ideas that resonate strongly with people. And if you can show that you have that, that long-term connection to the ground, to the landscape, and to the people, well, the locals are more likely to follow you. 
And I can't prove it 100%, but I think the clues are there to suggest that it's happening here too. I did mention that we discovered this previously unrecognised uh, upstanding rat. This is a defended homestead of the early medieval period. We didn't get to excavate it, unfortunately, but we did get to put in some test trenches. And those showed uh, that we had more iron slag and uh, possibly a number of furnace bottoms. So again, strengthening that connection to the iron working on the site. When it comes to the medieval period, we recovered from one of those uh, test trenches, we recovered one shirt, just one shirt of inverted rimware pottery. It dates to the 13th to the 14th centuries. It can be paralleled on numerous sites. And it gives us that uh, ability to, to tick off that checkbox that says, this, there is evidence of the medieval period here too. And even though it's the latest thing on the site, there is that, par uh, that parallel with that middle Neolithic globular bowl that how thinly the thread of our evidence hangs, that from some very small amounts of evidence, we, we, can, we can find the, the, the long-term settlement and continuity on this site. Now, in terms of conclusions, is it continuity or is it continual return? And I think however you look at it, Gertlonet is special. There is that rare level of, well, at the very least, continual return to a single, relatively small site uh, from the Middle Neolithic up to that medieval period. In parts, yes, it's sketchy, but it's, it's there. There's also a question of variety. Because we have on this one site evidence for almost every aspect of ancient Irish life from domestic, funerary, ritual, manufacturing, animal husbandry, it's all there. It's not necessarily everything from all periods, but overall there's a lot there. And again, it's unusual again from that, that small, small site. Also there's the level of its rarity, because certainly in rural County Cavan, there's been very little in the way of economic and structural development, certainly of the kind that has related to large-scale open excavation. So in that sense, Gertlonok is very significant, not just for the history of Cavan, but the history of Western Ulster as a whole. Now, imagery to remember. I have used this aerial photograph throughout this presentation. So I want you, and I hope you'll take that away with you as one of the significant things from this site. So we have our early medieval enclosure here. We have our whatever that Iron Age thing is there. We've got our wrath uh, up here on the edge and all those wonderful bits and pieces along the way. <laughs> and that's great, but I want you to remember this image as well. Because a lot of times, Archaeologists can get up and stand in front of an audience and proclaim themselves to be like the great and powerful odds, saying, this is what happened. I'm the expert, you're not. <laughs> what I hope that I've been able to do today is to give you a different image to remember, which is to pay attention to the man behind the curtain and to let you understand that how we put that evidence together and the stories that we're trying to tell. And with that... And apologies once again for the, uh, the breakdown in the middle of it all. But I'm going to thank you very much for listening and uh, to click my ruby slippers together and attempt to evade and avoid any questions you now have. Thank you.